Saka, the Deva King, once came to see the Buddha and asked him, why is there conflict in the world? Because even in his heaven there had been conflict. The Asuras and the Devas had, had a battle as to who was going to take over that particular level of heaven, and ultimately the Devas won. That's to say nothing, though, of the conflicts we have on earth. And the Buddha answered that conflict comes from within the mind. And he traced it back to various causes and finally got to what he called the, the perceptions and concepts of babancha. Now, babancha is a word that it's hard to translate, but it basically comes down to the sense that well, these concepts come down to the sense that I am the thinker. In other words, you take on an identity as a being, someone who does things. And all beings need to feed. That's what we all have in common. So we lay claim to the various mm -hmm. skills we have for eating, and we lay claim to the food that we want to eat. And the problem is that the food sources are limited. The range of food in the world, I'm not talking just about physical food, but all, all kinds of things in which people take their nourishment, is limited. And even if it weren't limited, the Buddha said, we'd never have enough. He said, even if it rained gold coins, it still wouldn't be enough for one person's desires. Because to be a being comes from desire, it comes from attachment. And it's voracious, and it's insatiable. So the question is, how can we live in peace? We have to look within. And the beginning phase is to see that our happiness cannot depend on the suffering of others. In other words, you have to eat with manners, eat in a harmless way. There are two passages in the canon. It's interesting. One is directed to a group of little boys, and another is directed to a king. And in both cases, the Buddha gives the same message. If you're looking for your own happiness, you can't harm other people. And it's interesting that kings are treated on the same level as little boys, because kings tend to have a larger range of what they think they can feed off of. In fact, in Thai they talk about how a king eats the kingdom. And you learn manners in your eating when you realize that okay, if you just eat without caring about anybody else at all, others are going to put up resistance. You have to see that your happiness cannot depend on their suffering. You have to, have to figure out how to find happiness that doesn't depend on other people's suffering. It ultimately comes down to three things, generosity, virtue, meditation. You learn to take pleasure not in eating all the time, but in giving things to other people. It goes against the grain, but when you begin to realize that there's a happiness there, this raises the mind above its ordinary level. Similarly with virtue. You realize that there are ways of finding happiness that would cause others, but you realize it's beneath you. You're beginning to raise the mind up above its feeding, especially with meditation. You find that you can feed inside. You provide yourself with a sense of well-being. Just sitting here with a breath, that doesn't have to take anything away from anyone else. You have your own independent source of food. Now, this source of food is not permanent, but it's a path to something that lies beyond feeding entirely. So that's the only place where true peace is going to be found, in nirvana. When the mind is finally free from hunger entirely. But you notice how the path works. You lift yourself above your ordinary ways of feeding. And you realize there's a part of the mind that, that doesn't want to have to keep feeding. Doesn't want to have to keep on being a being. Doesn't want to have to be driven by desire. That, that phrase in the reflections that Ratabali gives to the king. When the world is 
insatiable. It's a slave to craving. And you don't want to be a slave anymore. You want some freedom. Generosity is the beginning of your sense of freedom. You don't have to give in to your immediate desires. Virtue also gives you a sense of freedom. You're not going to be a slave to the desires that would cause you to harm others. You take some pride in the way you eat, and that it's not harmful. And meditation pulls you even higher, it makes you even more free. Now, what does this mean for world peace? Well, it means peace is going to have to be found inside. And we have to learn how to live peacefully in the midst of a world that's not peaceful. Because there's no way you can force people to be wise in their eating. But you can train yourself. And it's not just you that benefits, though. For one, you're taking one more mouth out of the feeding system. And two, but you're providing an example. There are people who talk about simply knowing that the monastery is up here. People living a life of virtue gives them some inspiration to lead a life of virtue wherever they are. It's true of not just this monastery, but all, all the places where people are practicing around the world. They provide an example. Of course, all of this depends on developing qualities that you might call qualities of character. In the Buddhist teachings, character is an important part of the practice. We tend to miss that as we come into contact with Buddhism here in the West, because we meet it either through the academic setting when we're taking a class in school, or through a meditation retreat center where we're taught a technique. We're taught a little bit about loving-kindness, which is just kind of a general niceness, but very little about character, the principle that you are going to be truthful and harmless in your search for happiness. Now notice that we're not saying you shouldn't search for happiness. I'm not saying that you should sacrifice your happiness for the sake of the common good, because the immediate th thought is, well, what about their happiness? If I can't search for my own happiness, why should other people be happy? What we're doing is looking for happiness inside in a way that promotes the happiness of others. We're doing it wisely. We're doing it with a sense of character. We're truthful in what we do, truthful in what we say. Truthful in the sense of not only of saying true things, but also sticking truly to the path, truly measuring ourselves against the teachings. What John Munn calls practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. He picked up the phrase, of course, from the Buddha. For the Buddha meant practicing for the sake of dispassion. Nowadays it means just practicing the Dharma as it, as it exists, and not trying to change it to suit ourselves. So that's the way in which you're true. And in being observant, it's not just watching things. When the Buddha taught Rahula how to be observant, it was basically be observed to look at your actions and see whether they cause harm. So to be observant is basically to be motivated by compassion. You want to make sure that your actions really do fall in line with your ideals. You see, these are the qualities of, of character that we need. They come down to the same thing as the, as the Buddhist qualities, wisdom, compassion, purity. Wisdom not only in knowing how to describe things properly, understand the mind properly, but also knowing how to be pragmatic and realizing that okay, if you have certain tendencies that would be harmful to others, harmful to yourself, you learn how to say no. You have the wisdom to be able to psych yourself up so you want to drop those tendencies. That's for things that you don't particularly like to do, but actually would be good for you and for others. So you learn how to talk yourself into doing them. This is where the rubber hits the road and the path. That's the kind of discernment that really is helpful. And of course, there's compassion. You want to make sure that in your search for happiness, in your eating habits, you don't cause harm. And purity is making sure that you f actually follow through with that. 
as the Buddha said, you know a person's purity by watching the dealings that that person has with others. So that you treat others well, you treat them fairly. So peace is to be found through developing a strong character. Again, it's some, nothing you can impose on other people, but it is something you can hold up as an ideal for yourself. This is ultimately right here where the Buddha focused his teachings. Sometimes you heard that the Buddha wanted to get rid of all forms of suffering. But actually he's looking at where does suffering come from? Focus on the cause. Stop setting fires that you then have to put out. Find the place where you're setting a fire and stop that fire, and then you're done. The suffering out there in the world that other people inflict on one another. That's the end of the process. The beginning of the process lies inside the mind. And it's here where the problem is solved. So as a John Sowat used to say, each of us has only one person. We have ourselves that we can train. We can hope to have a good influence on others, but that's going to be up to them to choose to follow that influence or not. But at least we make sure that we're responsible and we take care of the corner of the world for which we are responsible ourselves, i.e. the thoughts, words, and deeds that come out of the mind. And when you train those well, we can find that the peace the Buddha talked about, that doesn't require feeding, that doesn't even require being a being anymore. You don't have to lay claim to things. You don't have to strategize. Everything is done. That can be touched right here. And it's the only true peace there is.